This is why I hate VR. You put on that headset and you want to feel like a superhero, but you're not a superhero because you're tied to a chair. What kind of superhero gets tied to a chair? Virtual reality is attracting a lot of interest these days from entrepreneurs and investors. But beware, if you want to succeed in this emerging market, you need to understand what this new medium does best and how to avoid common mistakes. Jesse Shell has been designing VR experiences for nearly 30 years. Jesse stopped by G-School recently to share his hard-won advice for how to design great VR games. I started there in 95 and that was an exciting time because Disney was trying to figure out what, what can be done with this medium. Um, it, is, this, is this something that's gonna be part of theme parks? And so we did a lot of experimenting. We created this Aladdin's magic carpet experience and then uh, ended up helping to create a thing called Disney Quest, which was Disney's location-based entertainment uh, virtual reality theme park. And in 2002, uh, went to teach at Carnegie Mellon. I started teaching there, teaching game design, and also teaching a class called Building Virtual Worlds, where we were looking at best practices for creating VR worlds. And I've been teaching that class, uh, I've been part of that class for 18 years now. And so when VR started to become commercial in the last five years, I was very excited because it's something I'd been continuously working on for a long time. And so Shell Games got very interested and very involved. Shell Games was a studio I created while I was teaching at Carnegie Mellon. We started out with a handful of people, but over the last 16 years or so, we've grown it up to, I think we have 130 people now, something like that. And um, VR is a thing we really got into about four or five years ago. It's done very well for us. We've probably shipped about 15 different VR and AR titles of, of different types. The most important thing, the thing that VR brings um, is this sense of bodily presence. Many people think of VR and AR as technologies for the eyes, and that I don't think is right at all. Um, what they really are, they are technologies for the body. So VR and AR allow you to bring your body into a computer simulation. One of the questions we always ask is like, how, how and why is my body involved in this experience? And if we don't have a good answer, um, we often kind of back away and say, maybe this, maybe this shouldn't be VR, maybe this should be something else. Our brain has a special way of deciding whether the place around you is real or not, which I know sounds strange, but it's a, it's a thing, right? No, no one ever watches television and confuses it with reality. No one ever thinks those things are actually in the room with them. It almost sounds silly to say that someone would think that. But in VR, it happens all the time. It's not uncommon, for example, maybe I'll have a VR situation and there's a little table next to you and someone will come encounter a puzzle and they have to, hmm, and they think about this puzzle. What am I gonna do? I'm not sure what I'm gonna do. And you'll see it, they'll reach out and they'll lean on the virtual table. And oh, and it's not there. They're like, oh, oh, oh. And then of course, they knew intellectually that the table wasn't real. But the part of your body that decides what's real felt like, yeah, no, that's real enough. They bought into the illusion. It bought into um, the, the immersion. Everybody wants to use VR for history and they always imagine, oh, we'll just, we'll create the entire city of ancient Rome and everything in it that ever happened. I'm like, okay, great. That'll, that will, after, what do you do with the next $200 million, right? Um, so thinking about, well, okay, how could, what could you realistically do? And thinking about the fact that the, the hand capture and the head capture is interesting and think about VR as a creativity tool 
it just sort of all came together. The, um, one of the things that's very important to history educators is the idea of perspective taking. And we thought what better way to kind of take on the perspective of someone else than to actually be inside their body and like look in the mirror and there's that person. Then you put these historical figures in a TV studio and thinking about how the ability to produce interesting videos is very culturally relevant for teenagers uh, today. And so the thought of like, okay, well, you know, if what if you could make a speech as as Tecumseh or whatever historical figure you like, and and but do it with your voice and your gesture and your emotion, but somebody else's body, it just kind of uh, just seemed interesting. So we, we gave it a try. One of the biggest problems is the problem of motion sickness. There are many people diving in doing this have no idea what they're doing and create experiences that are uncomfortable, um, induce motion sickness and induce, uh, can potentially induce dizziness or, or have uh, after effects. Um, so that can happen, but it doesn't have to. It's really a designer's choice. Uh, many designers, they just don't care and they leave that stuff in there. Others choose to eliminate it. If you look at most video games, their central mechanic is usually running all over the place. And uh, VR is not great at that because you're because it's about your body. It brings your body in, but guess what? Your body's not really moving and your brain doesn't like that because it thinks it's being poisoned. That's where motion sickness comes from because there are certain toxins in the environment, uh, mushrooms and things, where when you eat them, they disconnect your balance sense from your vision sense. And evolution has learned that, oh, if your vision and your balance are not connected, you're being poisoned and you're gonna die. You better throw up soon. And so when that starts to happen, we start to get sick. And so that's a problem. The, the, the problem is VR is too real. Um, now, there's some really interesting cures for that. Like we're, we've been working with a company called Holoride. They have a fascinating technology that's all about uh, being a passenger in a car. So you're a passenger in a car and the car is sending uh, information to the headset about exactly how the car is moving down to a couple millimeters. And uh, that gets put into the simulation. So now you're in a situation where the motion of the car actually becomes the motion of the simulation. And the interesting part is the motion sickness is largely eliminated because now the motion ends up being very uh, real. Um, similarly, when we were doing the I Expect You to Die game, we didn't start with, hey, es uh, escape rooms, what a great idea, let's just do it. It started actually with a fight um, in the studio. I was big on VR and I was pushing people to work on VR, but a lot of people in the studio were not. They, they were against it. Um, and so one of our team members was working on this VR game and I'd give him very special instructions. I said, do not move the camera in the game. Teleport the player. When the player needs to go from place to place, I want you to teleport them because I don't want motion sickness. And they completely ignored me. And they made a game where when you click on another place, the camera would move in and move out and it was nauseating. It felt so bad when you played and I said to him, why did you do this? I told you, you should, we should do a teleport because it makes people sick. And he got frustrated and he said, look, this is why I hate VR. You put on that headset and you want to feel like a superhero, but you're not a superhero because you're tied to a chair. Because if you move, you're going to get sick. What kind of superhero gets tied to a chair? And we all looked at each other and we're like, whoa, that happens all the time. Superheroes are always getting tied to chairs and then they've got to figure out how to deal with it. No one ever made a game about that. And um, we all got kind of excited about that. And then we started talking about the, the scene in Goldfinger with James Bond where, where he's all tied to the table and the laser's coming. And James Bond says, so do you expect me to talk? And Goldfinger says, no, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. And we just thought this is, let's build a whole game around that. A 
key moment for us on our new sword fighting game, Until You Fall, we believed intellectually in the idea of a sword fighting game. Uh, and in fact, we, we'd helped make a lightsaber game um, for, for Disney using the, you know, Star Wars. So we thought, oh, we got this. We know what we're doing. And we started building it. And it was sort of kind of okay, but not great. But we were like, that's fine. It'll come together. It'll be fine. And then Jason Vandenberg, uh, we brought him as a consultant because he's worked on sword games a lot. And he came and he played it. And he's like, mm, you might be getting there, but your inner loop, it just isn't there. And I'm like, well, what do we, what do we need to do? And he's like, you need one good hit. You don't need to make a big game right now to prove anything. You need to show me that I swing a sword and hit a guy and it feels great and powerful and amazing because you don't have that right now. And we're like, we were always assumed, oh, we'll get that part later. And he's like, nope, you got to get that part. That's the innermost interaction in this game. You swing a sword and hit a guy. If that doesn't feel amazing, you don't know what you're doing. And we did that. We got, we, we, we cleared our slate and we spent the next two weeks just trying to get one good hit. And once we got that, it didn't work the way we thought. It worked a little different. And then we ended up building everything around and around and around. So I would say starting with the inner innermost loop can often be the best way and then and then work your way out. But man, there's so many ways to iterate, really. The idea of AR is powerful. The idea that you can actually augment the reality that's around you. But the problem is we don't have much technology that can really do that. Um, we have phones that can, you know, the phone technology can kind of make objects sort of float in space in a vague place around you. And even the high-end systems like the HoloLens and the Magic Leap, they, they don't have much understanding of the space that's around you. They can sometimes detect a surface or a vague shape of something like a chair or something, but they don't but there's not really, it's very difficult to actually augment the reality that's around you. And one of the phrases that we use a lot is augmented reality is better when it augments reality, right? Now, if I'm going to look at a screen and just float something in a vague place, why am I even doing augmented reality? Why don't I just look at this thing on the screen? What is the connection with reality going to get me? Uh, it's just much more technically difficult than VR is. And the applications are not at all clear for the mass market. They're really clear for all sorts of training and things. I'm gonna, if you wanna learn how to, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, work an oil rig, uh, and you can do augmented reality in the oil rig and walk around and do all sorts of tests there, that's great. But for the general person day to day, particularly with, with, with the technology not being very strong, we don't really know what it's for. It's not even great for games necessarily because games so much want to be about going and escape, going to a fantasy world. If every game I'm going to play is going to be in my dingy living room, that's, that's not what anybody wants. They want to go to kind of exciting fantasy worlds. So uh, VR, AR is in this kind of weird place. I, I believe long-term, there's a lot of power in the idea of AR. And ultimately, I think AR and VR are going to merge somewhat and they're going to merge sooner in an unexpected way. VR headsets with cameras on them being used for augmented reality, I think within the next five years is actually going to become uh, a pretty big, uh, pretty big thing. Want to be coached by people like Jesse? He's one of our VIP experts in G School, our high impact learning community for innovative product leaders. This program delivers the tools and training you need to supercharge your success packaged as an all-inclusive monthly membership. When you join G-School, you get a trained game thinking coach who will help you customize the learning experience and maximize your results. Weekly coaching calls where you can learn from world-class experts and connect with your peers around the world. Access to cooperative design fundamentals plus our entire course library sold elsewhere for thousands of dollars. An energized community of peers and experts ready to help you accelerate your path to success. If you're ready to stop wondering, am I doing this right? And start innovating smarter. Join us in G-School.